Venezuela may be preparing for an invasion of Guyana while tensions rise between Russia and Finland. We also discuss the devastating Russian losses in Avdivka and China's preparations for a potential war over Taiwan. These stories and another in this edition of the International Affairs News Roundup. On to the first story. War may be coming to South America as Venezuela eyes parts of Guyana for itself. Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro stated that a referendum scheduled for December 3rd will go forward and that will determine if parts of the region of Equisibo will be brought brought in as a new part of Venezuela. This region makes up two-thirds of the territory of Guyana. Meanwhile, Brazil stated that it has placed its military on high alert and stated that it has seen Venezuelan military forces moving towards the border with Guyana and that Brazil has moved some of its own forces towards the border of Venezuela. Now let's talk about why this is all happening now and where this all came from. Equisibo is home to indigenous people that have long lived in this area since before the Europeans arrived. However, since the colonial period, both the British British, the Spanish, and the Dutch have all vied for control of this area. In 1814, the Dutch transferred the control of this region to the British, and the British consolidated Ecosibo as well as a couple of other territories into British Guyana. Meanwhile, neighboring Venezuela, which was a Spanish colony, gained its own independence and contended with the British that parts of Ecosibo actually belonged to it. The dividing line for this dispute was along the Ecosibo River, and the Venezuelans contended that they should have control all the way up to the river. However, the British would continue to colonize areas west of the Equisibo River. After agreeing in 1850 to no longer colonize areas in Equisibo that belonged in each other's claims, tensions would rise again in the late 1800s as gold and other precious materials were discovered in parts of Equisibo that were on the west side of the river, so inside of Venezuela's claims, but well within the area of control for the British. In 1895, the Venezuelans would appeal for international arbitration, and they would specifically appeal to the United States, invoking the Monroe doctrine. Venezuela would state that this was America's area of influence and that the Europeans were stepping into America's area of influence and needed to intervene. This led to an arbitration meeting in Paris in 1899 which concluded that most of the territory of Equisibo belonged to Britain. This is obviously a result that Venezuela rejected. Since then Guyana would gain independence in 1966 and the dispute over the region would not at all die down. It would continue on. In fact it would re-emerge in Venezuelan politics after the discovery of oil and the 2000s off the coast of Ecosibo. Now today the Venezuelan economy is in shambles however its military strength still dwarfs that of Guyana. It should also be noted the routine visits of Russia's Wagner group prior of course to its coup and that Russia and China have strong relationships with the Venezuelan government and its energy sector. Brazil however views South America as its own area of influence and has maintained cordial relations throughout its history with both Venezuela and Guyana however during the Bolsonaro presidency it began to take a stance more similar to that of the United States against Maduro. And that of course has led to tensions between Brazil and Venezuela. Should the referendum proceed in Venezuela on December 3rd and the Venezuelans decide to go ahead and incorporate parts of Equisibo into Venezuela, then we're gonna really have to wait and see what happens. Should the Venezuelans decide to militarily enforce this referendum on Guyana, well, we'll have to wait and see what the Brazilians decide to do because this could easily turn into a larger regional conflict. And of course, this would have impacts on the energy sector and on oil prices worldwide. Now, we'll continue to monitor this on this channel. So subscribe if you want to continue to monitor this with us. And we're going to move on to the next story. Tensions are rising between Russia and Finland. Finland has decided to close all of its border crossings with Russia after accusing Moscow of aiding migrants in crossing into the country. Seven out of the eight border crossings had already been closed up to this point after a surge in migrant activity past this month. This last remaining post located in the Arctic circle will close for two weeks starting on Thursday. Finland claims that Russia is helping migrants to transit towards Finland in what they call a hybrid attack. And as such, the Finnish government has been gradually closing more and more border posts to prevent this. More broadly, however, these border closures have raised questions and concerns over Finland's response and their obligations under refugee law. And it also considers the potential dangers that asylum seekers will face in trying to escape Russia and get into Finland, as they'll have to navigate through harsh terrain, incredibly harsh winter weather, rivers, forests, and everything that they really do not need to be going through at this time of year. You may remember
remember something similar to this happening prior to the beginning of the Ukraine war, where Belarus and Russia both assisted in pushing refugees from Syria and Iraq and other parts of the Middle East over through Russia and Belarus to the border of Poland and the Baltic states. At the time, they would attempt to surge these refugees towards the border crossing, and once the border crossing was closed, they would attempt to surge these refugees to parts of the border that they believed were lightly manned or guarded. Refugees can be used as a weapon, and as I've just said, we've seen Russia and Belarus attempt that before. Finland believes that right now Russia is attempting to do the same thing with refugees from places like Morocco, Syria, and Pakistan, as well as a couple of other places. With the border crossings all closed, Russia may seek to move the asylum seekers to other parts of the border that might be lightly or not manned at all, and those refugees will have to navigate through incredibly harsh winter terrain. On to the next story. This is becoming one of the most brutal battles in the war in Ukraine so far. Russian forces are intensifying efforts to capture the city of Avdivka, which is just north of Donetsk city, and they're attacking the city from all sides. The town has been a focal point of the Russian advance since as far back as 2014. However, in the past two months, the Russians have greatly increased the frequency and volume of attacks on the city. Ukrainian troops have had some success in pushing Russian forces back. However, the sheer volume of attacks and the volume of Russian soldiers engaged in these attacks are creating challenges. Evdivka, the city, however, at this point is heavily damaged with every building so far in the city suffering some form of damage. The fighting at to this point has centered around the industrial zone and around the coking plant. And the fighting really hasn't progressed drastically since the fighting began. According to a report from UK Defense Intelligence, Russia is suffering the highest rates of casualties since the beginning of the war, with Ukrainian general staff reporting that Russia is suffering more casualties around Avdivka than they suffered at the height of the fighting around Bakhmut. However, that said, the UK Ministry of Defense has not been able to confirm the exact numbers that the Ukrainian general staff have released. While Ukraine is in for a tough winter, it's battles like these that Ukraine may be able to hold to that will create a significant amount of Russian casualties and might give them a chance long term to ultimately freeze or win the war. All Ukraine really has to do is just dig in, hold to well defended positions, and inflict as many casualties as possible. Battles like Bakhmut, Avdivka, and Volodar are places where Ukraine has been able to successfully do this, absolutely devastating parts of the Russian military. That said, Russia appears to be willing to trade lives for territory. During the Battle of Bakhmut, Russia claimed that once Bakhmut fell to Russia, then the Ukrainian line would break and they would be able to blitz them basically to Kiev. However, once Bakhmut did fall to Russia, that very much did not happen, and now fighting continues around Bakhmut to this day. Should the Russians take Avdivka, it might just be a repeat of the Battle of Bakhmut. It's also important to note that Russia isn't just losing soldiers, they're losing a lot of heavy equipment around Avdivka, which will pose advantages for Ukraine later down the line, as Russia will have a hard time replacing that heavy equipment for future attacks. On to the next story. The proxy war between the United States and Iran continues. Attacks on U.S. forces in the Middle East have resumed, with a drone attack on U.S. forces in Syria and a ballistic missile attack on a U.S. Navy ship off the coast of Yemen. These attacks are all believed to have been carried out by Iranian proxies, with the attack off the coast of Yemen believed to be by the Houthis. Critics argue that President Biden's response to these attacks have actually emboldened Iranian proxies to continue attacking, as since the war in Gaza began, there have been dozens of attacks on U.S. US forces, with some U.S. personnel being injured in the attacks, but not a significant amount of U.S. strikes back on IRGC or proxy forces. However, the strikes that have happened have targeted warehouses believed to contain ammunition and other forms of munitions, as well as a headquarters in Syria, which killed IRGC personnel. Despite all of this, however, things have not boiled into an all-out war, at least for now. And with the ceasefire in Gaza, the attacks on U.S. forces has declined significantly. However, once that ceasefire expires, it might might be expected that those attacks will resume. On to the next story. China may be preparing for war. Satellite images have revealed that China is increasing and upgrading its air bases all around southeastern China over what it views as what might be a potential war over the island. The infrastructure upgrades indicate that China is preparing and improving its readiness and military capacity for a war. For China to succeed in a war over Taiwan, it will need air superiority. For an example of what happens whenever an invading force does not gain air superiority, Superiority, just look at Ukraine. To enable this though, China will need an extensive amount of air bases of considerable size all around Southeast China, as well as the capability to 
sustain its air assets in the air while fighting in and around the island. These air bases will also need to be resilient and redundant to be able to withstand rocket attacks and missile attacks that might disable one or two air bases. And each of these air bases have gone through considerable changes with renovations to the runway and improvements in their ability to sustain and house fighter jets and other types of military aircraft. Should China have to face the United States in a war over Taiwan, the air war will become even more crucial. And China will have to maintain massive amounts of air sorties at all hours of the day across the entire theater of operations. Increasing this capacity indicates that China realizes that this is important and that they're taking steps to remediate it. Both China and the United States have significant geographical considerations over a war with Taiwan. Apart from sheer distance, both will have to contain with a massive body of water that they'll have to fly over, which draws importance to aerial refueling and other forms of long-range sustainment. China has launched routine air incursions over Taiwan over the past year, with increasing numbers of fighter jets and other types of military aircraft, and these have led to a significant amount of strain in relations between Taiwan and China, with Taiwan viewing these air incursions as practice runs. Comment your thoughts on this story or any of the other ones that we've talked about so far. I, I really want to hear your thoughts. Leave a like on this video if you found it helpful or informative, and I will see you all next time.